Spingarn, as a critic, says that a, a critic must ask what the creator aimed to do, whether has he fulfilled his aim, his plan of creating that artwork. He must also ask whether the aim is intrinsically worthwhile. He must, in other words, rate creation with reference to some standards set above his temperamental and that of the creator. According to the primitivists, on the contrary, the genius has simply to let himself go both imaginative and emotionally. And the whole business of the critic is to keenly look upon the impressions from the resulting expression that when passed through his temperament, it issues forth as a fresh expression. By thus participating in the creative thrill of genius, the critic becomes creative in turn. And so far, genius and taste are one. In this regard, Mr. Spingarn complies with Oscar Wilde as a writer who possesses that immense imaginative power, which is the genius, added with grace, added with literary consciousness, the taste. When we talk about judicious imitation, Walter declares that illusion is the queen of the human heart. Illusion is nothing but the imagination, the original genius opposed to the unimaginative neoclassical notion of normality, an imagination that is subject to no norms whatsoever, which means neoclassics held principles, norms to employ one's imagination, to set rules for imagination. Aristotle was not like the neoclassics, recognized the all-important role of illusion. The poet he says gives us truth superior to than that of the historian, superior because it is more representative. But in order to give us this representative truth, he goes on to say that the poet must be a master of illusion. He must be a master of the imaginative force. In Goethe's phrase, the best art gives us the illusion of the higher reality, of spiritual reality. And this has the advantages of being strictly experimental. The Greek genius consists not in getting one's uniqueness uttered, but in the imaginative perception of the universe. Homer says Aristotle is the greatest of poet because he never entertains us with his own person, but is the most constantly an imitator. Homer still remains the greatest of poets for this very reason. He paints with his eyes on the object. The object is human nature. It has been said, on the other hand, Shakespeare dwells at the very center of human nature, which means he is disciplined to reality. His imaginative flow is all about humanity, of human nature, of reality. At his best, he is ethical in the Greek sense. Mr. Spinkan says that a writer or an artist must let loose of his imagination to wander wild. Such a writer will be gifted with genius along with taste. He puts no check on his imagination and is at the same time convinced of his spiritual exaltation. It is not a way, fair way to go mad, but one may disagree with him in deeming this madness a divine madness. What is this divine madness? He means that a writer who dwells deep into the imaginative world fills himself with higher realities, with spiritual exaltation, with spiritual thought. And this kind of madness is what he terms to be as divine madness. In its mildest form, this whole theory of genius and taste encourages conceit in its more advanced forms. Megalomania. After all, the doctrine of imitation merely means that one needs to look up to some standard set above one's ordinary self. Mr. Swingon's exhortation to get rid of both a inner and outer exhibition and let ourselves go amounts in effect to this. Now let us consider a moment 
the true relation between a creator and a critic, that is between a writer and a critic, between genius and taste. Not to speak of other and other differences, the creator differences differs from, from the other critics, not merely in having genius in general, but a mysterious and incommunicable gift. The writer differs from the critic by this element, this mysterious and incommunicable gift. Do you know what it is? It is nothing but the writer's own imagination, which cannot be commun communicable, which is incommunicable to a critic. The musical genius of, of Mozart, for example, cannot be accounted for in any such fashion. For Mozart, his musical experience, his musical creation is entirely a different one. It is his own ex expression, his own composition, which has taken him to a different world of, of imagination. That cannot be simply put across to a critic. In the critic's ears, it is entirely a different one and entirely a different interpretation. Same like how it is in literature. Now to make a comment on the 17th century French cr critic who says like this, it is not enough to have great gifts. One must also know how to manage them. Though a man's genius may not be in the power, the control of this genius to some human end largely. Okay, to determine this end, he must look to standards. If he is not to be a mere traditionalist, he must create with an aid of the ethical imagination. If he does not seek to humanize the gift, if he is content to be a mere unchanged force of nature, he may have genius almost any amount of it, and yet remain, as Tennyson said of Hugo, only a weird titan. So do you understand this? By this he means that not only the artistic imagination should be there for a writer, for an artist, he must also have the power to constrain, to restrict himself at certain places of his own imagination. He must have some control over his imagination. He cannot let loose. Yes, of course, he needs to let loose of his mind to create a piece of art, but at the same time, not to a great extent. When he's unleashing, unleashing the great force of, of imagination, he's almost considered to be a madman. Such artists or writers who possess genius, who possess the great talent of having an extensive imaginative mind, but do not possess taste, the literary conscious side of it. He will, such artists will begin to have taste only when he refers to the creative expression and his impression of it to some standard that is set above both. So what is needed of, a, of an artist or a writer? First, he possesses genius. The raw material is his imaginative power in which he lives. Second, is the literary consciousness. Now, which is what we understand it to be as taste, but how to signify this word taste? How? So the word taste refers to the creative expression and his impression which has been relevant or which has been equal to some standard. That standard is the ethical standard. That standard is the moral standard. That standard are the standards of values for society. That standards are to be taken from the classicals, classical literature, from the classics. 
That standard must be taken from Shakespeare for a writer to acquire a true literary conscious is not so easy but a writer must possess that a creator an artist must possess that literary conscious is what we call it as taste otherwise his genius would go in vain he would be a rather like a madman with his imaginative force an unrestricted force finally to conclude this essay on genius and taste these two literary components these two literary elements genius and taste which i previously referred to be as the imaginative force and the literary consciousness when they are both balanced and employed in a piece of work of writing the literature grain gains its credibility so such emphasis on genius and taste does not only reflect in literature it also finds relevance in paintings for example the paintings of michelangelo have got both the genius and taste this is the interpretation of genius and taste in the critical essay of irvin babbitt thank you